Welcome back. Last lecture, we experienced the glory of Rome, manifested in great arched structures that reflected both the needs and the aspirations of an empire. But arches fell on hard times with the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. This period of economic and cultural disintegration was once labeled the Dark Ages, though modern scholars now use the more neutral term, late antiquity. But from an engineering perspective, this was a dark age indeed for Western Europe, as the imperial stimulus for technological innovation disappeared and the well-developed Roman system for training engineers and disseminating knowledge collapsed. But as the medieval era gradually emerged from the ruins of the Western Empire, the return of prosperity and the restoration of urban centers created a new building boom. Even so, it wasn't until the 11th century that significant numbers of major construction projects were under undertaken. These projects focused primarily on two types of structures, fortifications and churches. This is Krak de Chevalier in Syria, a fortification constructed by Western Crusaders in the year 1031. Fortifications of this sort are fascinating from the perspective of military architecture, the physical configuration of walls, towers, gateways, and battlements to create an integrated system of defense. But from a structural engineering perspective, fortifications are somewhat less interesting. In some places, the inner walls of this castle are 100 feet thick because they were designed to resist the impacts of battering rams and catapult projectiles rather than normal structural loads. So, in this sort of a structure, there are no long spans, no towering heights, no major structural innovations. And as such, structure and form both tend to follow function in fortifications. In this case, the function of defending the ramparts against an enemy. In churches, on the other hand, the influence of structure is quite significant. And so I'd like to focus on these buildings in today's lecture. Now, in late antiquity and in the early medieval period, Christians adopted the Romans' standard civic building, the basilica, for many of their churches. This is a typical example of the secular form, the basilica of Constantine in Trier, Germany, built in the early 4th century AD. Note that the basilica is a simple rectangular hall with an apse, that's the semicircular extension on the left-hand end. And here's that same form adapted for Christian worship, St. Michael's Church in Hildesheim, Germany. St. Michael's was completed in the year 1031, 700 years after the Basilica of Constantine. Yet the only substantial change to the architectural form is the addition of arcades and aisles on either side of that central hall, which is called a nave. Now, in earlier lectures, we also saw two Italian contemporaries of St. Michael's, the Basilica of San Giovanale in Orvieto, built around 1004, and, of course, my personal favorite, San Miniato al Monte in Florence, built in 1013. Note the consistency of the basilica form, a nave, two side aisles, and that semicircular apse at the front end. These three simple buildings represent the first step in the development of medieval church architecture, the starting point for a process that in less than 200 years would culminate in the great Gothic cathedrals. So let's talk about the early Christian basilica. Back in lecture nine, we did a detailed analysis of the structural system of San Miniato, and I won't repeat it here, but for the purpose of today's lecture, I would like to talk about just a few key points about the structural system using a much simplified model. At its most basic level, the structural system of this early medieval basilica consists of simply two walls and a series of roof trusses which frame and support the roof. The roof trusses carry the loads associated with the roof deck, any snow that accumulates on the roof, and of course the weight of the roof trusses themselves, 
And I'm going to simulate that load by adding this weight to the top of our model roof truss. And this weight, uh, this, this is my loading device. Uh, it actually has a stack of 50 steel washers on it. That's a pretty substantial load for such a small truss. And the intent really is simply to show that this truss carries this load quite effectively. And perhaps most importantly, the truss is carrying load as a self-contained structural element. And when I say that, I mean that it's generating only vertical reactions out at the supports, as opposed to the vertical and horizontal reactions that we, we, we would see on an arch, for example. Um, the other thing that I want to establish by loading this truss at this point is that it provides a sort of a baseline for comparison with subsequent load tests that I'll be doing. Now, if the truss generates only vertical reactions, then when we apply Newton's third law, we'll see that those upward reactions on the truss correspond to downward loads that are transmitted by the truss into the walls, which are then transmitted, transmitted in axial compression down through the walls and into the structural foundations. And that's our baseline structural system, the structural system of the early medieval basilica. So how does this flow of forces affect the architectural form of a medieval basilica like St. Michael's? Well, notice the plain, unbroken appearance of the nave walls and those small windows up near the top. These characteristics are actually a direct reflection of structure. Because the roof trusses generate only vertical reactions, the walls only need to transmit these vertical forces downward, as we saw in the model. They're functioning effectively as columns, transmitting axial load in compression. The absence of lateral thrust coming from those trusses means that the walls don't need to be particularly thick. However, there need to be vertical load paths from the points where the trusses are located down through the walls to the structural foundations. This means that the windows need to be small and arched on top, and they need to be spaced far enough apart to provide those load paths vertically downward. So the architectural appearance of these early Christian basilicas is, in fact, influenced by structural concerns. The influence is subtle, but it's there. In this sense, form follows structure in the early medieval basilica. Now, by the 11th century, European builders were becoming increasingly aware of the ruins of great Roman structures around them, as well as Byzantine architecture in the East. And so they began incorporating more characteristically Roman architectural features into their churches. The architectural style that emerged from this change is called Romanesque. We can see hints of this trend in the early 11th century buildings. In the arches of the nave arcades, for example, San Miniato actually used a few columns that were salvaged from ancient Roman structures. By the middle of the century, this trend had greatly accelerated as builders attempted significantly larger structures and began experimenting with vaulted ceilings. An impressive example can be seen in this church, the Romanesque Cathedral at Spire in Germany. It was commissioned in 1030 by the Holy Roman Emperor Conrad II, who intended it to be the largest church in Western Christendom. The cathedral was consecrated 37 years later, and it remains the world's largest intact Romanesque structure today. Spire Cathedral was one of the earliest Romanesque buildings to use groined vaulting. Recall that a groined vault is formed from the intersection of two barrel vaults coming together at right angles, as shown here. Originally, only the side aisles at Spire were vaulted. This photo of one of those aisles shows how the vaults effectively divide the space into a series of rectangular bays, just as we saw at the Baths of Karkala. Note the characteristic curved X shape of the intersecting vaults within each bay. Now, originally, the nave of the cathedral was roofed with wooden trusses, just like San Miniato. But around 1090, the Emperor Conrad's grandson, Henry IV, initiated a major reconstruction project aimed at enhancing his own stature as Holy Roman Emperor. Indeed, Henry justified the building project on the grounds that his imperial cathedral required appropriate imperial Roman architecture. And perhaps inspired by the emperors Caracalla and Maxentius, Henry chose to use vaulting as his symbol of Roman imperial power. And so, 
Vaulting was added to the nave of Spire Cathedral, resulting in the majestic interior that we see today. But vaulting the nave entailed much more than just adding stone vaults on top of existing nave walls. The main transverse arches had to be supported on something, and so these elements called engaged columns had to be added to the vertical piers. Let's see if we can simulate Henry's rebuilding program on my model. In its current configuration, the model actually represents the nave of Spire Cathedral before Henry's modifications were initiated. Now, what we want to do is to subdivide the nave into a series of rectangular bays using heavy semicircular arches, like these. So, we want to take an arch and place it within the bay. In fact, we want to take a series of arches and place them in the bay. But we can't do it because there's nothing to support the arches on. So the first aspect of this rebuilding project would be to add engaged columns, which are really just thickened portions of the walls on the interior of the nave, which now provide platforms on which the arch can be mounted. Now we can place that series of heavy arches along the length of the nave, which effectively subdivide the nave into a series of rectangular bays. And then finally, the spaces within those successive arches would be filled in with appropriate groined vaulting to complete the vaulted ceiling. Now, at this point you may be wondering why I've left the roof trusses in place on my model. Didn't the stone vaults replace the roof trusses? Well, no. In Spire Cathedral, and in all medieval churches for that matter, the roof trusses are still up there, above the vaults. It's a very clever arrangement, actually. If stone vaulting were exposed to the elements, it would be very susceptible to leaks and to deterioration from successive cycles of freezing and thawing. But by placing a wooden roof structure above the vaults, the vaults are fully protected from the weather. At the same time, the greatest hazard to wooden structural elements like the trusses is fire. And that hazard was particularly great in a building that was illuminated with candles and torches on the interior. So the stone vaults serve to protect the wooden roof trusses from fire. The vaults protect the trusses, and the trusses protect the vaults. There is, however, one big problem with those stone arches and vaults. They're heavy. Because they are arches, they generate tremendous lateral thrust, a phenomenon that's particularly problematic because now the vaults are placed on top of tall columns. Last lecture, our equilibrium analysis of the Arch of Titus demonstrated that the tendency of a column to overturn is directly proportional to its height. The taller the column, the more likely it is to tip over, even if the arch thrust stays constant. Let's see how this phenomenon is manifested in my model which now includes the interior arches. Once again, we want to test the functioning of the, of the structural system by applying a load to it, and once again, I'm going to use my loading device. We'll start with the device being empty, and we'll add to the load in increments so that we can gauge its effects on the structure one, one bit at a time. So now my loading device is in place, and I'm going to begin by simply adding a stack of five washers to the, load, to the uh, loading device. Okay? So far, so good. Let's add another stack of five. Now, if you look close as the load is applied, you're going to see that in practice, with each little increment of load, the walls of the building are in fact starting to tip outward. The amount of tip is relatively small at first, but the more load is applied, the more you can see this gap opening up between the outside of the truss and the outside of the wall. And now I can put just a few more of these washers in place, and the walls are so unstable that they are, in fact, collapsing. So clearly we can see, note that, that the structure collapsed with a, a, a stack of washers on here, which is significantly smaller than the amount of load that was applied to the earlier basilica that had only roof trusses forming the roof of the structure, Clearly, we have a problem associated with these arches that needs to be overcome in order to have a viable structural system. How did medieval builders address this problem? Our analysis of the Arch of Titus indicated that in addition to the height of the columns, 
There are two other factors that influence a column's stability, its weight and its width. We can increase the column's stability against overturning by making it heavier and by making it wider. And indeed, the builders of Spire Cathedral used both of these factors to good advantage. As you can see here, they added weight by making the walls and the piers very massive, as you can see, and they added width by building these thickened sections on the outside of the church. The thickened sections are called buttresses. And to see how these buttresses work, let's try once again adding them to my structural model. A buttress again is really just a thickened section added to the outer wall at the location of the arch where that additional stability is most needed. And I've now added those buttresses to the structure. And now we can replace our loading device Put the trusses on to make the structure complete. And now let's return the loading device to its position. And we see that, yes, there is still somewhat of a tendency of that load to cause the structure to tip outward. It did move a little bit when I put the load in place. But indeed, nonetheless, I can still add significantly greater weight. In fact, I can add that entire stack of washers back to the structure and it remains stable. So the simple addition of these buttresses to the exterior walls significantly increased the load carrying capacity of the structural system. As structural elements, buttresses work in three different ways. First, they provide a very robust vertical load path that transmits the weight of the vaulting down to the foundations. Second, most importantly, they stabilize the wall against overturning by adding both weight and thickness. And finally, they also strengthen the walls against lateral bending. As we've seen in the Spire Cathedral, the overall impression of Romanesque architecture is one of strength and solidity. And we can see these qualities in all of the great Romanesque churches, like Vesale Abbey, shown here. Here again are all those characteristic features of the Romanesque style. Heavy semicircular arches, groined vaults, engaged columns, subdivision of the nave into successive rectangular bays. Our analysis has showed that all of these features are strongly related to structural concerns, most especially the need to restrain the lateral thrust of arches placed on tall columns. Once again, form follows structure. Now before we leave the Romanesque era, I'd like to visit one more great structure and one particularly interesting detail. This is the monumental Romanesque cathedral at Trier in Germany. Let's zoom in on this particular section of the West End, immediately above one of the main doorways. Notice this masonry arch that's entirely embedded in the wall. It's called a relieving arch, and its job is to divert most of the compressive force in the wall laterally, so that those three smaller arches underneath and the main doorway aren't subjected to as much load. Romanesque builders actually borrowed the relieving arch directly from Roman buildings. In fact, the Roman Basilica of Constantine is located just a few blocks away from the Trier Cathedral, and you can see that same detail in this building. But if you think back to our discussion of the Great Pyramid in ancient Egypt, you'll remember that we saw essentially the same arrangement in the empty chambers above the king's burial chamber. From a structural perspective, those angled granite slabs covering the uppermost chamber are, indeed, just relieving arches. Some structural ideas truly are timeless. Returning for a moment to Spire Cathedral, notice how the use of groin vaults allows for larger windows to be placed higher up on the nave walls. This row of windows lining the top of the nave is called the clear story. In this feature, we see the seed of a new architectural form. The Gothic style emerged in Northern Europe in the late 1100s. The development was gradual. During that long transition period, many buildings with mixed Romanesque and Gothic features were built. Mont Saint-Michel Abbey in Normandy is one such transitional structure and a striking one at that. But by the mid 1200s, the Gothic style was fully developed and fully manifested in magnificent buildings like Rouen Cathedral, shown here. A reflection of the religious zeal of the era 
Gothic architecture emphasized height and light. To achieve these goals, Gothic cathedrals featured ever taller naves, pierced by ever larger clear story windows, and delineated by ever more slender engaged columns. In general terms, the structural system of a Gothic cathedral is similar to that of a Romanesque church. The weight of the main arches and vaults is transmitted outward to the tops of the columns as both vertical reactions and horizontal thrust. However, with taller naves, lighter walls, and thinner supporting columns, the tendency of the lateral thrust to overturn those columns is much greater. Gothic builders met this challenge with four major structural innovations. The first was Gothic architecture's most defining feature, the pointed arch, which replaced the semicircular arch of Roman and Romanesque structures. The pointed arch was not a Western invention. It was probably developed in Syria in the 6th century, and medieval builders most likely encountered it in Islamic buildings in Moorish Spain. For example, in the 8th century Great Mosque at Cordoba, above the West Portal, we can see pointed arches created in the intersection of overlapping circular arches. The incorporation of this element into the Gothic style, however, was absolutely critical to its structural success. The pointed arch is structurally advantageous because it generates significantly less lateral thrust than a semicircular arch does. As we proved in Lecture 8, lateral thrust is inversely proportional to the height of the arch. Double the height and you'll cut the thrust in half. The height of a semicircular arch can only ever be half of its span, but a pointed arch isn't constrained in this way. And, as we've seen, a pointed arch also conforms more closely to that ideal arch shape, a parabola. So a pointed arch can be made much thinner while still completely containing that parabolic thrust line, and therefore remaining stable. A thinner arch is a lighter arch, and a lighter arch generates less thrust. Now I should add at this point that the pointed arch is also advantageous from an architectural perspective because the height of a pointed arch is not defined by its span as a semicircular arch is. The arches forming all four sides of a rectangular bay can all be the same height even though their spans are quite different. Now the second innovation inherent in, in the Gothic style. Ribs were added to the groin vaults of the nave. In this photo, the ribs appear as curved X shapes within each bay. The ribs stiffen the vaults, and they transmit the weight of the vault more effectively out to its four points of support at the corners of each bay. By adding ribs to the vaulting, builders were able to make the vaults thinner, and thus reduce their weight, and again reduce the lateral thrust. Let's pause now to evaluate the effectiveness of these first two innovations by building a model of the cross-section of a Gothic cathedral. We'll start with those tall, slender, engaged columns. And now we'll add that characteristic pointed arch. Resting on top of the engaged columns. Of course, as with all medieval buildings, there's a roof truss on top to protect the arches from the elements. Now we have that characteristic form of the Gothic uh, cathedral. Let's add some load and see how effective this system is at load carrying. I actually don't have much space between the truss and the top of the arch, so for the moment I'm going to uh, take that roof truss off just so we can put the load on without having to worry about the truss. <laughs> You'll notice that just the loading device is already causing the, 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 uh, the columns of the Gothic cathedral to start to tip outward. I'm going to start with a stack of five washers. Columns are a little bit unsteady. I'll put the second stack of five washers in place, and we'll notice that this structure is on the verge of instability. I just have to touch it slightly, and it falls outward. In the interest of saving my model, I'm going to relieve, relieve it of its load at this point. And we'll put our roof truss back in place. As this demonstration shows, the pointed arch may have reduced the lateral thrust considerably, but the benefit wasn't enough to guarantee the stability of those tall, slender columns. So if reducing the thrust isn't good enough, 
then the only other possibility is to strengthen the supporting structure. Enter the flying buttress. Flying buttresses took many forms in Gothic structures. Here they are along the nave of Chartres Cathedral in France, and here they are along the nave of Strasbourg Cathedral. The essential characteristics of all flying buttresses is that they're external and physically separated from the nave. This characteristic greatly enhances the character of Gothic interiors because the buttresses then allow light to enter the clear story windows unimpeded. Despite all their variety of shapes, all flying buttresses work essentially the same way. Let's see how they work by adding some flying buttresses to our model. Luckily, I just happen to have some right here. And all we need to do is plug the buttresses in. As you can see, that fundamental characteristic that they are physically separated from the nave is present in my model as well. And once we've connected the buttresses, we are ready once again to try a load test to see the extent to which the flying buttresses have improved the load carrying capacity of the structure. So we'll add the loading device. I can put my trusses back in place reasonable confidence that the structure will survive. And we know that because the flying buttresses have tremendously improved the load carrying capacity of the structural system. Now I can add my entire stack of washers and there is no significant tendency of this structure to overturn as a result of that load. So the flying buttresses have tremendously improved the load carrying capacity of the system. Now, I said there were four principal structural innovations associated with the Gothic. We have one more to talk about. That fourth structural enhancement was the addition of pinnacles to the tops of the buttresses and the flying buttresses. And I'll simulate those pinnacles here. At some point, these might have seemed mysterious to you, but now I'm reasonably sure that you already know what they do. As we've already found out, weight enhances stability. And the principal function of the pinnacles is to add to the weight of the buttresses so that they are even stronger against the tendency to overturn under the action of the thrust of the arches. Here, you can see the stone pinnacles at Bourges Cathedral. And it is important to recognize that the pinnacle is much more than just those two little pyramids up on top. Everything above the buttress is part of the pinnacle, as I've highlighted here. It's quite a substantial mass of stone. You know, more than any other Gothic feature, the pinnacle demonstrates that architectural elements that are often thought to be purely aesthetic actually have important structural purposes. As the soaring, brilliantly illuminated interiors of Amiens, Troyes, and Coutances cathedrals vividly demonstrate, the overall impression of Gothic architecture is one of height and light. As our analysis of these buildings demonstrates, these architectural effects could only have been achieved through structural innovation. Viewed holistically, the ribbed vaults, pointed arches, slender columns, and flying buttresses of the Gothic cathedral created a fundamentally new type of structural system, a stone skeleton. This light, efficient load-carrying system with clearly delineated load paths stands in stark contrast to the solid masonry of Roman buildings like the Basilica of Maxentius. In the fully developed Gothic stone skeleton, we can see that medieval builders have finally surpassed the Romans in sophistication. Amazingly, we can also see a preview of the iron and steel skeleton construction of the 19th century and beyond in these Gothic structures. In viewing the structural sophistication of Gothic architecture, it's sometimes difficult to comprehend that this system was developed entirely empirically through trial and error. We must conclude that the medieval builders developed a deep qualitative understanding of structural behavior, perhaps even more so than the Romans. Nonetheless, there's an inherent limitation in empirical design. In a trial and error system, errors are inevitable. You know, a few years ago, I was traveling in Europe with my wife. And because I've never met a Gothic cathedral I didn't like, we mapped out our itinerary to ensure that we'd visit all of the great Gothic, Gothic cathedrals of the Ile-de-France region. The cathedrals at Chartres, Amiens, Coutances, and Laon are all wonderful buildings. But by far the most interesting from an engineering perspective is the Cathedral of Saint-Pierre in the town of Beauvais. 
Begun in 1247, it was to be the tallest cathedral in the world, the true pinnacle of Gothic architecture. But in 1284, with only the apse completed, a large portion of the vaulted ceiling collapsed. The apse, which you're now looking at in this video, was eventually rebuilt, but as you can see, the nave was never constructed. Oddly, the quest for height continued, and the world's tallest spire was added to the building in 1569. But that attempt also ended in disaster, as the spire collapsed just four years later. At this point, the trial and error process of cathedral design had reached the limit of possibility for stone construction. Saint-Pierre remains unfinished today, and no taller Gothic cathedral was ever attempted. Now, when I visited the interior of Saint-Pierre, those few years ago when we visited Europe, I was astonished to see evidence that that great failure of empirical design was still evident in the structure today. After the first collapse, when the apse was reconstructed, the builders doubled the number of columns, thus reducing the loading on each column and rendering the structure safe enough to survive, if only in its incomplete form. And here you can see one of those extra columns effectively splitting a single long span arch into two shorter spans. Now, before this lecture, had you visited Beauvais, you might easily have overlooked this seemingly insignificant detail. Today, I hope you can see it for what it is, a rich case study in the development of Gothic architecture and the limits of empirical design, literally written into the walls of the building. Every great structure has a story to tell. Some are not as vivid as the story of Beauvais Cathedral, but the story's always there. Part of that story is cultural, part is aesthetic but an important part is structural as well. In this lecture, we've seen the rise and fall of the Gothic cathedral. The process began with early medieval builders adapting Roman architectural forms to the needs of Christian worship. These forms eventually evolved as builders continued to seek greater height and lightness. By the end of the Gothic era, a fundamentally new and significantly more sophisticated structural system had emerged. Yet all of that progress literally collapsed with the fall of the greatest of all Gothic cathedrals, Saint-Pierre at Beauvais, a dramatic reminder of the inherent limitations of empirical engineering. Next lecture, we'll trace the development of a new structural form, the dome, and in doing so, we'll see some of the same structural principles applied in new and fascinating ways, and with new possibilities that overcome some of those inherent limitations of the arch. Until then, thank you.